The first accession of the plebeians is one of the most important and legendary events in the history of Rome. It was Rome's first general strike, and the legacy of the event would result in the establishment of the Tribune of the Plebs, one of Rome's most important and famous political positions. But why did it happen? And was it actually real? Let's talk about it. Before we get any further into today's episode, I just want to quickly ask that you subscribe and like if you enjoy my content. It really helps the channel out and it motivates me to make more content. Now back to regularly scheduled programming. As we've already discussed previously, the last Roman king was overthrown in 509 BCE. This ushered in a period of relative instability in the Roman political machine. It had just lost its head, and despite the fact that the Roman historians like to paint the transition between the kingdom and republic as seamless, it most certainly was not. One of the largest issues was that, unlike the king, the top political appointment, the consul, was not elected by popular election. Instead, the consuls had to not only be a patrician, but they were also elected by the other patricians. Likewise, the Roman Senate at this time was composed exclusively of patricians. The plebeians, the majority of the Roman soldiers, and the majority of the population, were not very happy with this. After all, they had just lost what little bit of political power they held. They at least had a say in the election of the kings, even if it was a fairly small say. But in the election of the consuls, they had no say whatsoever. This outrage over a loss of political power was compounded by the fact that the plebeians were being crushed under a great burden of debt. We are told the story of a former army officer, who now in his advanced years threw himself into the Roman Forum at the center of the city. The people recognized the man as a great military man who had distinguished himself in battle. He apparently had a wild look about him. His clothes were dirty, his hair and beard had grown far too long, and his body was thin and pale. He told the Roman populace who saw him that during his time serving in the recent Roman Sabine War, the enemy had sacked and destroyed his homestead and farm in the Roman countryside. At this time, a further tax was placed upon him to pay for this war, and with no income due to the loss of his property, the man was forced to borrow money to pay this tax. Sadly, however, the lender the man was forced to deal with had given him an extremely predatory loan that the man could never get ahead of. And so, with no way to pay the loan, the man was forced to give up his grandfather's farm, then his father's, and then finally a third property. When he was not able to pay anything more, he was thrown into a prison where he was tortured and threatened with death. He showed the whip marks on his back as proof. I personally kind of doubt that this story is true. Instead, I imagine that over the course of the years in between the overthrow of the king and these events, which occurred roughly in 495 BCE, the burden of death grew and grew among the normal people of Rome. And eventually this spread over into the Forum and the dispute we are talking about. I seriously doubt it was one singular person who urged the Roman people into action. But whatever the case, we know that the Roman people were not happy. We are told that the man's story infuriated the people in the Forum, and word quickly spread. Debtors from around the city heard of the uproar and quickly fled to the Forum to beg for protection. Shortly thereafter, a massive and furious crowd had gathered in the Forum, and it quickly attracted the attention of the two consuls. Appius, Claudius, Sabinus, Regillinus, and Publius, Servilius, Priscus, Structurus. The crowd of furious citizens demanded the Senate be summoned so that a solution could be afforded to those in debt. It seems like the consuls gave in and summoned the Senate. However, so many senators were afraid of the crowd of people, it can be inferred here that many of the senators were the predatory lenders, that the Senate did not have a quorum and thus no business could be conducted. The people began to grow even angrier as they believed the Senate was simply dragging its feet in the hopes that it would all blow over. The senators quickly realized that nothing of the sort would happen, and they convened yet again in the Roman Senate House. However, they could again not come to any sort of agreement, and the issue remained static. Appius, one of the consuls, urged the Senate to call for the crowd in the Forum to be dispersed by the Roman military, while Servilus, the other consul, urged the Senate to grant some sort of concession to the people. The issue itself seemed to be at a standstill. However, the Romans still faced several other threats besides their own people. Shortly after the standoff began, an emissary from a Latin city arrived and told the consuls that a Volsian army had invaded their territory and requested Roman assistance in dealing with the army. Rome agreed. However, the Roman people simply refused to sign up for military service so long as the dispute between themselves and the Senate was ongoing. 
This meant that Rome would not be able to send any sort of army to help the Latins. The Senate, both dejected and probably infuriated, sent Servilius to negotiate with the crowds in the forum. Servilius addressed the assembly. He noted that the Senate had been considering legislation which would lessen the burden on the plebeians, but had been interrupted by the news of an invasion. He begged the people to put aside their complaints for the moment and unite in throwing the Volscian invasion back. He further issued his own edict, which ensured that no Roman citizen, plebeian or patrician, would be detained, either in chains or in prison, from enrolling to fight, and that no soldier should, while serving in the army, have his goods seized or sold, nor his children or grandchildren arrested. This quickly freed all those debtors who were imprisoned but could serve in the military, and they themselves quickly swore their oaths for military service. This apparently was enough for the crowd, as they followed in swearing their own military service. Servilus led the army to face the Volsi, and would return victorious shortly thereafter. Crisis averted for now. The troops, of course, returned along with Servilus. They, as well as the other plebeians in Rome, expected the Senate and the consuls to take swift action to alleviate their burdens. However, Appius, the other consul, began issuing edicts and orders that not only overturned the edict issued by Servilus prior to the war, but also ordered the imprisonment of several other debtors. A soldier, who was about to face imprisonment because of Appius, appealed to Servilius to save him. However, the Senate and Appius were apparently in lockstep, no guesses as to why, and Servilius was powerless to act, as his edicts would have simply been repealed by the Senate and or Appius. This earned Servilius the hate of both sides, as the Senate viewed him as a populist, while the people viewed him as unwilling or unable to help them. This was further compounded by the need to dedicate a new temple to Mercury, the Senate and the Consuls were unable to come to a consensus on who should be the person to lead the dedication, and so the issue was thrown to the People's Assembly. In order to spite the Senate and the Consuls, the people chose a high-ranking military officer in Marcus Laetorius, who just so happened to be a plebeian. The Senate, along with Appius, were outraged. However, this did nothing to curb the feelings of the people. At some point, shortly after this dedication, the people eventually happened upon a debtor, being led to the courts, presumably to be shortly in prison. A mob quickly formed and freed the debtor. Violence quickly broke out, and despite the decrees of the consuls, the creditors were attacked and beaten by the crowd. Shortly afterward, the Senate issued a decree ordering the enrollment of the people into the army to deal with some Sabine invasion. This time, however, Servilus was not able to convince the people to enlist, and the decree was ignored. Appius quickly blamed the entire episode on Servilus and after telling Servilus that he had betrayed the Republic, took matters into his own hands. Appius ordered the arrest of one of the plebeian leaders. As the man was being led away, he exercised his right to appeal to the people of Rome for judgment. At first, Appius was reluctant to allow such a thing. However, he was quickly convinced by his advisors to allow it to occur, lest he further inflamed the people. This created yet another impasse and this one would last until the ascension of two new consuls in 494 BCE. Aulius Virginius Tricultatus Calinomontus and Titus Vatilius Geminius Circanius, wow, talk about a mouthful, both started their consuls in 494 BCE. During this time, the leading members of the movement regularly met on either the Esquiline or the Aventine Hills. The consuls quickly caught wind of these meetings and summoned the Senate to decide what to do. This quickly backfired, as the Senate was enraged that the consuls had not used their own authority to shut down these meetings, and it seems that they were so incensed that they could not even hold a vote at first. Eventually, however, the Senate firstly rebuked the consuls for not acting, and then ordered that the army lists should be enrolled as quickly as possible so as to distract the people. I'm not too sure exactly what the Senate thought was going to happen. I assume they thought that the people would just happily go along with this, and the issue would be over. Spoiler alert. That's not going to happen. The consuls then ascended the rostra, a large platform in the forum where speakers would stand to give speeches, and ordered young Roman men to enlist. None responded. Instead, a crowd of people gathered and informed the consul that no one would enlist until their public rights and liberties were restored. The consuls were stunned, so stunned that they simply left the rostra and returned to the senate without even responding. The younger senators called the consuls cowards and called on them to resign. The consuls retorted that the situation was much more complex and serious than the senate believed, 
and invited them into the forum to observe the crowd refusing to enlist. The consuls, this time accompanied by several senators, returned to the rostra, where they again asked the man who they knew would refuse to enlist, and the man, surrounded by supporters, did not respond. The consul sent one of their lictors to seize the man, but the crowd quickly pushed the lictor back. The senators, shocked and probably infuriated, attempted to help the lictor seize the man, but they too were thrown back. This probably would have escalated had the consuls not intervened and separated the two sides. The senate was again recalled. The senators who were just involved in the incident called for a criminal inquiry into the people, and apparently a great deal of shouting erupted as the various elements of the senate argued over what to do. The consuls branded them as unruly as the people in the forum, that's a sick burn, and eventually a vote was held. Three different propositions were considered. The first came from the previous consul, Appius. Appius believed that the people were only willing to continue their protest because they knew they had a right to appeal to their fellow citizens. He called for a dictator, whose decisions could not be appealed, to be appointed and for that dictator to settle the issue. I have no doubt that Appius wished for this to result in a great deal of bloodshed. Another former consul, Titus Larcius, called for the Senate to institute some sort of relief for those who were in debt. Of course, this was undesirable, as many of the senators, or their families, were their creditors. In the middle of the two proposals was one from Senator Publius Virginius, who said that relief should only be given to those who had served recently in the war of the Acuri and the Sabines. The proposal by Appius was supported by the majority, and though Appius himself was nearly declared dictator, the Senate instead chose a man of a more moderate disposition, in Manus Valerius Maximus. Manus was the brother of Publius Valerius Popicola, whose agnomen, Popicola, literally meant friend of the people. Remember that Popicola was one of the leading members of the scheme to overthrow the monarchy, and it was he who instituted the right of people to appear before a people's assembly. Thus, the Roman people were actually not all that nervous about being subject to Manus' dictatorship. And this is where we will pause for today. The city of Rome now stood on the precipice of great change. The question was, which way would the winds turn? Would it be the people who would benefit from the appointment of a dictator? Or would the Senate and the patricians stomp out any popular discontent through the unchecked power of a dictator? Join me next time to find out. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned something. I am sorry that this video has taken so long to come out. I truly love this section of Roman history, and I want to ensure that I capture the events as perfectly as possible. If you have any further comments or questions on the video, or believe I've made a mistake, please comment down below, and please like and subscribe if you enjoyed. It really helps the channel out. Peace.